the missionary had to convince the African, the conquered person, that everything about him is evil. Everything about him is devilish. Because the only true way is the way of the conqueror. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Masharia Munene. I'm professor of history and international relations at the United States International University in Nairobi. History is dynamic. It is through history that people get to know themselves, uh, their character, and to develop ability to strategize and safeguard their interests. If people do not know their history, their background, the forces that have shaped them, they then tend to be shaped by other people. And uh, the essence of being human is to perpetuate yourself and your kind, your interest and not to perpetuate some other groups or interests at the expense of your own. Imperialism and colonialism are conquests. One people beating up on another people and imposing their ways of lives, of thinking, or doing anything, then only then do they feel happy and they can talk about their empire and that means that they have made other people believe in their own superiority and uh, that uh, the right way to do things anytime is to do it the way of the conqueror. So colonialism was a, an exercise in imperial conquest and uh, to do that effectively there were three instruments that were used. You had the soldiers with their guns and uh, whatever else they did to beat people into submission. Then you had the administrators. Uh, sometimes the soldiers became the administrators. And the administrator's job was to govern the conquered people in the way with the foreign rules and new laws that serve the interests of the conqueror, that is the colonial state. The third instrument uh, were the missionaries. Um, their job was to soften the conquered, in this case the African. Uh, called the native. Once he's softened, uh, he's then uh, manipulable and uh, he can be acculturated um, into the ways of the conqueror. So, and to do that, the missionary had to convince the African, the conquered person, that everything about him is evil. Everything about him is devilish. Because the only true way is the way of the conqueror. When the white powers met at Berlin in 1884 and 85, and their purpose was to agree on how to claim territories in Africa without killing each other in Africa. That was the purpose. And they agreed on the rules that you go to a place, if there is no, if there is a flag of a white power, you know it's taken. So go somewhere else 
If it's not there, plant your flag and let everybody know. And then it's yours. But then to prove that it's yours, you have to have effective occupation. Effective occupation meant beating up people into submission. That's why the soldiers come in. Um, and then once they are beaten, you have administrators and then the missionaries to soften them. Now, the three of them working together were very effective. In, let's say in Kenya, what became Kenya? Because by 1914, virtually any, every segment or section of Kenya, uh, then the people in it had been beaten into submission. And they were beginning to imbibe the ways of the white man. The problem was that although they accepted they were beaten, they, were, they did not ex accept everything that they were told. Some of them developed a habit of learning from the enemy but still thinking because part of the conquest was to stop people from thinking uh, because thinking was supposed to be a monopoly of the conqueror. See, before the representatives of the British, the Imperial British East African Company showed up here, there had been rumors about particularly the, the Kikuyu country. So those people are very bad, they're very hostile. And um, they, not many white people were passing through here. They tended to scatter around. Uh, but gradually they started coming and they found out the hostility, that was just a rumor because some people wanted to, you know, uh, scare them or do some other things. Those who came were received well. But some of them did not behave very well. Hmm? And uh, once they started behaving badly, then you had those commotions. Like the Waiyaki story, yeah? Waiyaki welcomed uh, Lugard. They even became blood brothers and entered into a treaty. But those who came after Lugard did not behave the way Lugard had been, the way he implied that he would behave. So you have frictions coming in. Now, when um, the company went bankrupt and the company was simply an agent of the British government, there used to be in those days in Europe uh, you claim a territory or a place, uh, then you have one of your companies run the place for you. And when the company goes uh, bust, nobody, you don't allow another country to come and take. You, you, you remove the company and get in and do it properly, which is what happened in 1895. The company went broke or was removed. Its employees now became employees of the government. Yeah? That's where you get people like John Ainsworth and people like Francis Hall, who now became the conquerors of uh, particularly the Kikuyu country, yeah? mainly uh, Francis Hall. And Francis Hall was fortunate uh, to find a collaborator among the Kikuyu. First of all, there was Kenyanjui. And then his friend, a trading friend called um, uh, Karoli Kure. And Karoli was operating in Tudo area in league with a roguish white man called John Boyce. So they called him Karianjahe. And they were working together. Now in his various conquests, at one time, Hall was known to say that he would like to wipe out all the Kikuis dead because they are not good people they do not listen like either other people in kenya they don't do what they are told so the best thing is to wipe them out completely that's one sentiment the problem was if you want something done they are the only ones who work so given a choice between who are stubborn, people who are stubborn and work and people who are docile and don't work. So give me the, the stubborn ones because they work. Once they agree that something needs to be done, they work. 
So he was very happy with these people whom we wanted to eliminate um, in that sense. Um, some of these things are contained in his letters to his father, eh? uh, in that little book, uh, the Kikuyu, uh, Kikuyu uh, District, it's called. He is the one who is credited with conquered the Kikuyu as a people. Mm -hmm. But before he died, he predicted that the way things were happening, and the way he sees these people and the aggressiveness and stubbornness, one day there will be a war between the whites and these people. Uh, and he would not want to be there when it happened. And then he died. So in his honor for having helped to create part of the British Empire here, they named a whole district after him. So that's why it was called Fort Hall, after Francis Hall. So that's one Mzungu predicted there would be war. The other one was uh, Mena Chagin. And this in his um, Kenya diaries uh, explains how he, he used to conquer places, do whatever he used to be. Of course, one of the peculiar stories is the one about Kehumboine where some people had killed a white man in Vika and uh, so he went to find out who it is. Well, they, they, no, they caught this one white man and then at the Kihumbuji, that's where they killed him by putting him on the ground and tying him down and then uh, putting unpleasant liquid in his mouth until he died, the um, uh, whole village. So he came and wiped out the whole village. Um, and that may be said to be among the earliest massacres one can talk about, uh, British massacres in um, So, But he too, you see, the common thing about these two white men is that, yes, they were killers, they killed people, but they were also realistic enough to say something is wrong. Eh? So Menas again said, one day, the white people and these people we we'll have a war. And his reasoning was that uh, you cannot come from nowhere, you come and take everything, the land and everything, and expect people to be happy. So there will be a, he lived long enough to see it. Hall died. So there was that uh, prediction that there will be a problem, right from the beginning. Now, the people like Ainsworth, uh, and Elliot, uh, Charles Elliot, uh, who went out of the, Ensworth was a, an administrator, a, D, uh, a DC, PC, and chief native commissioner. They, they, they created that hierarchy. All the administrators were white. District officer, dis, uh, uh, district commissioner, provincial commissioner, and chief native commissioner were all white. But below them were these Africans who were made chiefs or headmen. Their job was to force other Africans not only to pay taxes, but to do what the white man says. So they were the ones who are used to recruit labor into the white man's places. So when these white people came and they were given a lot of land, and they did not have labor, and they were not very good anyway. So one way of assisting them was to underdevelop the Africans. Those who are self-sufficient had to be made dependent. So you destroy their livelihoods, and taxation was one way, so that they can go and work for the white man in order to pay the tax. In in Kenya, in the currency of the day. So in those days, to be an African was to be overtaxed. So there used to be a debate as to who is an African or who is a native. And so you find people at least along, along the coast saying they don't want to be called natives. Because if you are called a native, you are overtaxed. 
and uh, so you have that distinction that we're developing. We also had uh, the emergence, apart from the settlers who are coming in and being given all the land, then you have the Indians who sometimes tended to imagine that East Africa was their America. In the way the Europeans used to go to America, the Indians could come where? Uh, to East Africa, is the America. And among the leaders of that kind of thinking was Jivanji, uh, who used to be a big time trader. He opened the British and other to colonize the place, uh, to build the railroads, to make money. Uh, he was very effective, but he was an Indian. So though very prominent, sometimes he there developed these conflicts between what the Indians wanted and what the white settlers wanted. To whom should this land belong? And the whites insisted it was going to be what they were calling, they started calling white man's country. So this place was being developed as white man's country, in which the Indian did not have much of a position, a place. Now, Jivaji is the one who started the, the newspaper, The Standard, mainly because there was somebody with a paper of his own who had said nasty things about him. And they were competing in business. So he decided to start his own newspaper to destroy the other guy. Um, and once he finished, he destroyed the guy, secured his own business, he sold the paper to the settlers. That's how it became a settler paper. And the main mouthpiece for the settlers for the period of the, of the, the, the colonial period. Now the competition between these two would help in generating political developments in future. Um, one of the things the settlers did was to demand that they be given freedom or no, a role in the governing of this place. Because it was usually the commissioner appointed from wherever, so they want to have a say. That's how the Legislative Council started, as an advisory body initially to the governor. And the governor used to be the speaker of that assembly. The issue of electing people came later. But could see the agitation that was taking place. The settlers were creating their own country in their own image in which the African had no place except as a subordinate. And they were encouraged by some Americans, particularly former president Theodore Roosevelt, who visited the place in 1909 and urged them to do it, turn this place into a white man's country, that it would be a crime against humanity not to do that, and, uh, but do it with firmness and fairness using the missionaries. So that's what's going on. You have the missionaries are doing their thing. The administrators are doing their thing. And um, the government is doing its own thing. So when the Great War came, the Great War is what was later baptized as World War I. Because they could not call it World War I, they didn't know there would be another one. <laughs> so it was called the Great War. Um, and going back to the understanding at Berlin that white people would not fight in Africa. That was the understanding. Yet, when the war broke out, and you have some German on one side and some Britons on the other side, in the colonies, they started fighting. Now, something maybe I should uh, revert to a little bit. After the Berlin Conference, the sense of legitimacy was removed from the Africans. Sovereignty, freedom, they had no role. Decisions were to be made in Europe, European capital. So when the Europeans agreed on something, then it became so. Or the so-called partition and all the things. were simply agreements in European capitals. Now, part of that agreement is that, okay, that's your territory, this is my territory, but we shall not fight in where? 
in Africa because it is, well, the Africans are inferior beings. We should not be seen to do that. And in fact, that had been the reason they met at Berlin mm -hmm. to avoid white people killing each other. But when the war broke out, they started killing each, fighting in Africa. And the question was, what will the Africans be used for? One, they can pay taxes and contribute to the war by donating their wealth, by cattle, goods, whatever. Uh, Chief Koinange donated some cattle to the war effort at the time. But they will not be trusted with fighting because this is a white man's war. The best thing they could do is to carry luggage for white people to kill each other. So that's where the notion of the carrier corps comes in. They are simply car carrying luggage for white people to fight each other, but not themselves to shoot. That's why we have an estate in Nairobi called Kariako. And if you go to Dar es Salaam, you find another place called Kariako. During that war, that war period, some Africans were happy. They thought now that white people were killing each other, they are going to go away. Hmm? Get out of here. They were unfortunately, instead of getting out, they forced them to carry luggage. <laughs> into, so the experience was not that the best of, of everything. Um, and some missionaries like John Arthur was instrumental in uh, recruiting his African converts into the Karia Corps. And so they went marching and singing onward Christian soldiers, uh, things of the sort. Um, at that same time, that's when the Crown Lands Act of 1915 was passed. And what this Crown Lands Act said, all the land in British East Africa, as it was called at the time, belonged to the Crown. So Africans did not own anything because the land belongs to the crown. They became tenants in their own lands. In 1915? When some tried to question that through the new legal mechanism, the court, the court said, you have no business complaining because you have no capacity to own. Only the crown owns the land. The settlers had started agitating because they have been agitating all along and getting what they want that the territory should, the status should change into a crown colony. Before that it was simply British East Africa protectorate, territory. In the hope that under the colonial office they will be able to have a say big say, and they maybe get some money some from the colonial office. And the government then appointed uh, Major General Northey, Edward Northey, to come and be governor. And Edward Northey then supervised the, a new wave of white settlers. These were mainly soldiers. The white soldiers who fought in the Great War needed to be rewarded. The rewarding was to bring them to this place and give them land. The difference with the earlier settlers, the Delamares and the Grogans and the Macme those were rich people. And in fact, at that time, they did not want white people who are poor, because it would be a bad image. But after the war, all these soldiers, that's why it was called the soldier settlement scheme, they were brought in to be given land. They had no money, they had no skills, they knew nothing, but they wanted land. So Edward Northey's job was to settle them give them 
And then once they are settled, they need help in terms of labor, in terms of transport. So extend the railways to different parts to where they are settled. Now these settlements meant dispossessing people. Eh? So people play like Tigon uh, here, move people so that the soldiers who are coming have a place to take. There was also the change of the currency uh, from the Indian rupee eh? to the British uh, Fathom or something like that, eh? uh, which was of less value than the rupee, the shilling. Eh? Now, the payment to the Africans, when they used to be paid by, in the form of a rupee, now being paid in the form of a shilling, and people being cheated that is the same, uh, that was a source of complaint. So what I'm saying is that the end of the war creates some sort of tensions. Some chiefs came together. Although they are chiefs, yes, but this land alienation affects them. So they try to talk about it, uh, but they didn't go very far. It is in that context that now Hari Duku comes into the picture. One of those young, literate people who had been exposed to different types of readings. And uh, he starts uh, organizing and raising questions about policy and application. That there was a contradiction there. What the official British government was saying was the policy and the practice in the colony were two different things. That's why he could then think of writing letters to Britain to complain about what was going on here. Imagine this picture, post-war picture. Edward Northey, the soldier settlement scheme and the soldiers he's settling and giving everything they want. Then you have the Africans complaining that things are not going well for them. And the introduction of the Kipande, the identity that they had to carry around uh, like dogs. Yeah? Then you bring in the Indians who also had aspirations of also making a name of being comfortable here. And the settlers were saying they don't want Indians here. Because yeah? this, this white man's country, not Indian country. The Indians were fortunate that they were, had an Indian office in London. Because India being the biggest, the jewel was special. So you start having a friction between two immigrant communities, the white settlers and the Indians. And then somewhere in between comes in the Africans, agitating. And both of them claim that they, they had the interest of the Africans. Now, Hari Dhuku, very strategic thinker, tried to get in touch with external forces. to unite natives in East Africa. That's why he had an East African association. Trying to get in touch with known people in the US, like Marcus Gavi, youth. they used to correspond, Marcus Gavi and uh, Harry Duku. Um, and uh, he knew about Booker T. Washington. He didn't know much about, but he knew at least he was a black man who had done something good. Uh, he knew about uh, W.B. Du Bois, and his dream was that these successful black people in America would help him, would help to establish educational systems here that would educate people and prepare for a way to get rid of the white man in order to have what? Independence? Yeah, that was Harry Duku. So you have these. African young man writing in the newspapers and in writing uh, into London 
making a habit of contradicting the governor. So it came to a point where he had to be stopped. And that was in 1922 when they decided to stop him. They arrested him to stop contradicting the governor and other uh, incitements. Locked up at the Kingsway police station, which is central nowadays. Duku was then sent to Kismayu, which then was part of uh, Crown Colony and Protectorate of Kenya before the British donated it to the Italians in 1924-25. And Duku was then shifted from uh, Kismayu to somewhere in northeastern before he was released back. And then you have the feud between the Indians and the settlers. So it became necessary for the British government to call a meeting in London mainly the Indians and the settlers, to discuss their problem. And it was in that meeting that the missionaries reminded, advised the British to remind these two people that this is not their land. Thus the genesis of the Devonshire white paper, which said that primarily Kenya is an African country. And when the interest of the, of the immigrant communities and those of the natives collide, the interest of the natives will prevail. Of course, it being understood that the, the, the natives don't have capacity to, to know what their interests are, <laughs> to be the missionaries deciding that. The other thing to come out of that was the question of the type of education to be given to the natives. And the feeling was that there may have been some missionaries, some other people, who are not giving the right education to natives. After all, how could Vuku come up? Okay? So you need to investigate. They sent a commission from New York, a commission that was connected with what was happening at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, the one founded by Booker T. Washington. And the Tuskegee mentality is what the Americans exported to Africa. What this mentality said was that black people by nature should not aspire to equal the white social political aspirations. Forget it. But you can train them to be very good technicians, mechanics, plumbers, masons, uh, things that require hands but not the mind. Eh? Uh, so don't bother them with uh, things that challenge the mind. So that was the Tuskegee mentality. So this commission sent to Africa to investigate and recommend policies, education policies. That's the Phelps Stock Commission. Eh? White men, one black. The one black was a Ghanaian, or a Gold Coast, called James Agri. There is a school in Nairobi named after him, Dr. Agri. Um, his job was to convince Africans to accept what they are being told. So they went to West Africa, they came to East Africa, they went to South Africa, and Agri, that's all he was doing, telling his people, my people. There often is a difference between the message transmitted and the message received. Mm -hmm. To many of the African elite, they didn't want to hear what he was saying, but they wanted to know what he represented. Though he was telling them to concentrate on technical things, 
he was not there because he's a technician. Huh? It's not because he's a good carpenter or mason or mechanic. Whatever he has that makes him respected and he can accompany white people wherever they go, we also want it. Huh? So you get with that some movements. So in West Africa, you get people like Nkrumah, uh, Azikiwe, and others. They also want to go and get what Agri had. So they come here, and you have um, the chief, Koinange. And of course, the chief does not expect him, uh, his son to be a mechanic. <laughs> Supposed to rule, eh? <laughs> so, Whatever Agri has, he wants it for his son. That's how Mbioko Inange was then sent to the US for those uh, to know what it is that had happened there. Mbioko Inange was not the first native to go to the US. There had been two Maasai young men before, taken by Theodore Roosevelt to go and coach them to become Booker T. Washingtons of this place. They failed and were miserable. Uh, one of them became a chief and he was not very happy uh, in the soil. But Mbio Kainange was a difference because he went and stayed 10 years. Um, became friends with some future poly agitators in the black community. Um, Ended up at Columbia University, which is a good school. Uh, got a master's degree. We passed through London and he met Jomo Kenyatta. And they uh, became friends. Might even have helped Kenyatta design the jacket of his book, Facing Mount Kenya. Um, returned to Kenya. And when he returned, and of course in London he picked up two, one or two certificates. Eh? from the University of London and Cambridge University, but uh, his desire to do something in Oxford did not materialize. Um, but there he was, comes to Kenya, and uh, he's um, given a job to teach at Alliance at a lower salary than white people who are less qualified than him. So he refused. He said when he was paying school fees, he did not pay less because he was black. And so with that, then he decided to start Gidhungori Teachers College. Mm -hmm. huh? Now, while he was away, <laughs> huh? in the colony, the authorities decided with Uku out that there should not be any more colony-wide organizations for natives. It should not be there. Now, if natives have things to complain about, they should be channeled through local native council. That's how they were created. Uh, and the presiding officer in the local native council was a white DC. So they'll be controlled, eh? how they come up. Uh, but no more colony-wide movements. Now, out of that, some people in Fort Hall um, decided uh, what can they do to get Duku back. And so they are the ones, once they managed to get themselves elected into the local native councils, they formed what became the Kiku Central Association, KCA. So among them, Joseph Kangede, Jesse Kariuki, James Buter, you know, the very far-sighted people and the agitative. So make it a, a Kikuyu central thing. You know, those started in Kahuya, it's everywhere. And it spread as a unifying force. And as a unifying force, it ended up being at loggerheads with the colonial government. 
because it not only united people, it even started a newspaper. Moigui than here. And recruit, uh, recruited a water meter reader in Nairobi, one of the elite, eh? Johnston Kamau. And so he joined these people, started the newspaper, Moigui than here, as the editor. Then when the people started saying they wanted to, because they were not being heard locally, can they go and be heard in England? And the question is, who do they send? Preference was James Buter, but Buter could not go because he was occupied, yeah, working for the railroads. He had interest to um, and a family. So who is next? Johnston. And although he also had a family, he left. <laughs> no, see, see, he had Margaret. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> and then we <laughs> But he left. He was an adventurer. He went to go and agitate. I sent petitions to England. When he returned, he found the colony to be in a cultural crisis. That was the, over the issue of uh, circumcising women, which now had become a challenge. Um, the settlers. I mean, not the settlers, the missionaries mm -hmm. saying that this thing has to stop. Yeah. And then these people took it as a, a challenge. It's a cultural issue. Eh? They claimed that the reason the missionaries wanted girls not to be circumcised was so that they can marry them. And when they marry them, then they take more of our land. So no, 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 you can't, you're not going to do it that way. And they started raising questions because the missionaries were insisting that to be a Christian, you stop everything African. And it was Joseph Kangeda who raised the question. Do I stop being a Christian because I'm an African? Or do I stop being a Christian because uh, I'm uh, being an African because I'm a Christian? Which is which? You, you cannot be both a Christian and an African. So you know, the thing became, and the, even within the mission community, missionaries, they were quarreling about the whole issue. So we had that cultural crisis. And since with that cultural crisis you have this problem, anyone who circumcises women should not be part of us. So in that case, then have your own church. The independent. Huh? And since they are not wanted in schools, have your own schools. So out of the cultural confrontation, you have the rise of independent churches and independent schools. Now during the war, Mbioko Inange had expected it to be appointed uh, in the Legi Corps because he had been agitating for it. He was not. So the governor decided to look for an African who is good. And they found Eliud Madhu. Eliud Madhu was the right person because he could speak very good English. He had been to Alliance, he didn't go abroad. Um, he went to Fort Hire and he ended up at um, Oxford. Uh, and uh, so he returned and agreed to teach with a lower salary because he was black at Alliance, the thing that Koinangi had refused. <laughs> so he was the right person. If you are going to experiment, this is it. So in 1944, he was appointed the first native member of the Legislative Council as an experiment. Now, despite the background of his appointment, Africans were excited. At least they have one of their own. Eh? <laughs>